Hello, everyone. Welcome to All In On Real Estate. I'm your host, Aaron Goins. I started this meetup because when I was in the military, no one in my circles talked about real estate. A lot of times we talked about uh, debt and other finances, but no one talked about real estate. And I want to start a meetup where people can talk about learn real estate, learn about real estate, and start building generational wealth for them and their families. So I'm very, very excited for our guest speaker today, Mr. Parker Purcell. How you doing, Parker, man? Good to see you. Uh, you know, y'all say you're the gold chain on, man, looking fly, man. <laughs> I'm trying, bro. We uh, finally moved into our new building here in Birmingham. So super pumped. My ha I was going to be doing it for my house, but uh, our internet on that side of town, for whatever reason, Spectrum, I don't know if any of y'all have them, but they're acting a fool right now. So I had to hop out in about 20 minutes for six, which I'm on central time. So I'm a couple hours ahead, but right. I had to come back because I don't know what's going on. Who knows? But happy to be here. Happy to be, you know, seeing you all. So, uh, so yeah, appreciate it, Aaron. I see my man, my man, Payne Stewart in the background. Bro. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love Payne, man. I got yeah. also, I can show you here to the side. It's a picture of Tom Watson. Oh, okay. 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 My, my dad drew that. He's an artist. So wow. Okay. Dad's he, uh, he drew, so this right here with my thumb. He drew that picture as well. Uh, he's done all the major golfers you could think of, Palmer, Snead, Jack Nicholas, all those guys. Uh, and that one is by far my most favorite one he's ever done. He's got one – he got them hanging up all over the country. He's got one in Butler Cabin in Augusta National hanging up there, Bobby wow. Jones. Wow. So, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, that, that, that is cool. That is cool. Never, never sold one. He's only given them away. Wow. Wow. He does it because he loves it. It's a hobby. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get started. Let me, let me just ask you right away, man. Have you learned, what have you learned from your dad with that, with, with into real estate or, or just a work ethic? Man, so kind of plays in my backstory a little bit. Uh, so I grew up uh, about 45 minutes south of here on a farm. Uh, we got about 3,200 acres. We were in the family fertilizer business for 115 years, uh, sold out in 2006, uh, and then basically took the waterfall from there and reinvested it back into the property uh, to build a small uh, boutique resort. Mm. Um, so growing up, my mom was military, so I very much identify with just I'm type one diabetic as well. So I was going to pursue the military. I really wanted to, but being type one diabetic, it kind of just throws you out from being able to, you know, get into service like that. So I just was like, all right. Um, and my mom would physical discipline, you know, spankings, all those. I'm just going to say when you grow up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, nobody knows what's going on out there. And that's the way that she liked it. So, you know, everything that happened to me growing up, I just am super thankful for it. Uh, honestly, like most people from the outside would say that uh, Parker was fed with a silver spoon, but behind closed doors, that was far from the case. And really a, a tribute to where I am today because of that work ethic and really living in a state of gratitude and understanding that uh, nothing comes for free. Nothing comes without hard work. You have to earn it. Um, and so, you know, it's a little background for me and even how I landed here at the EQRP, uh, I was at the family business. And then when 2020 hit, I stepped out in unemployment voluntarily, pressure washed for about eight months. And then uh, really was kind of looking for, a, I wanted to step into something new, something really challenged me, uh, really didn't understand much of this space in general, uh, especially real estate. I would say I was very much like your novice retail investor. I buy a house, I have a mortgage, and I pay it off as quick as I can, right? And little did I know when I came into this community, like the way I look at a dollar now is so different than how I did 18 months ago. Uh, and obviously seeing the value of, hey, I, I mean, most of you on here, I feel like I've met or seen, we've all conversated in some fashion, uh, but being around this community is just, amplified me and my knowledge so much so really thank you to y'all for being able to you know just opening up your minds and 
time to me to learn because it's been great. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Um, I just want to ask a question about the um, the family business for our selling. What have you learned from that experience that you can implement now with, with that selling? I mean, was it something that, wow, you know, I, I, you, something you really realized during that process that you're like, man, I can teach, I can teach others about. Yeah. Um, so when the business sold, I was about 13 years old at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, going through some transition recently with our family business, uh, I'd say the, we entered into a partnership with somebody that really is kind of changing the, the business strategy of where we're going. We're completely changing our model. And I will, even though it's not apples to apples situation of selling in, in the partnership, even though we gave up some equity, it's all about, you realize how much, when you go into business with the right people, how easy it is. And this partnership that we had with this group was so easy. We spent three days in Dallas and we left like we had been friends for life. When our business sold back in 06, my dad was telling me about the negotiation process and uh, just how uh, toxic the whole thing was, right? And so it was hard. It was hard for him to, to, he wanted to make sure that he was protecting the family, right? Like you're, you're looking out for the best interests of your employees. It's not just him. Like, he's like, I'm in, I'm basically giving all these people over to this new company. And, uh, that was really hard for him to do. So, uh, taking care of your people. Cause when we sold, we, we gave every employee that worked for us, which we had operating plants, manufacturing plants, we gave them all a, a piece of the pie when we left. And it wasn't like a, Hey, here's a $20 gift card to Chili's. I mean, it was like a, this was like a big paycheck for them. And it was just a thank you for everything they'd done for us. So it was real cool to see that. And years later, seeing people come back and still talk about how it was the best years of their life. That was a really cool thing. Yeah. I think that's cool, man. Uh, I think, you know, that's, that's a lot of, you know, I, I find it fascinating when you talk to people who family was into real estate beforehand and seeing how they are, or, or there's something, a transition they had that, you know, they, they can learn from, from the, and, and how they, how it resonates to them now and how successful they are because of the things they learned as a child um, doing that. So I, I find that real fascinating. Um, so, so take us along the journey now. So, um, you know, when you, when you first started, what was your expectations for it? Um, and, and how did you get from point A to point B to where you're at right now? Uh, so I guess it, rephrase that question. So when, when, you, when you first, when you first started your, your, your career path now, okay. you any business, um, take us from that point, from after the pressure washing business to when you started to, to now. Yeah. Um, so I had a friend, I, I was part of Bible study group with a, some guys around my age. And, um, during that time, one of the guys worked here at this company at EQRP and he told me, he said, Hey, I really think that you would, uh, benefit from talking to our owners, David Morris and Damian Lupo. And, you know, to be quite honest, I didn't know anything about this company or what they did. All my view was like a financial advisor firm I was going to take people out to coffee all the time, ask for referrals for friends. You know, we all know the whole spiel. We had people call us and do that. Um, and the more I got into it, it was the environment, this community was so entrepreneurial. People like yourself are our clients. Uh, people that are out there that are solopreneurs, business owners, really out of the box thinkers uh, and realize that what we were doing was helping liberate people and give them a platform to really amplify the things that they care about and value being financial freedom, control, those things. And so uh, I really had to be a I'm very competitive. And so coming into an environment where 
I mean, every single day I learn so much. I, I mean, there's numerous questions that I have to help clients work through or, and it's fun. It's a joy because I learn at the same time. Right. So, you know, I've been here almost, well, a little over 18 months now and uh, we're just, we're, it's a growing company. It's changing every single day. Uh, and we were, and we're really here to help build a community of like-minded individuals that value freedom control uh, and the ability to have less red tape around their life and how they invest. Last week, we talked about why don't people uh, syndicate enough? Um, how has having the right partner benefited you in the space you have right now? Man, um, so we, we have a separate arm of our company that does syndicating, uh, but we're more of like, we partner with great operators out there, uh, raise capital for their projects. So our clients can passively invest into those deals. Um, and a couple of the, a couple of the deals that we've had thus far, you know, we've got currently over a little over uh, 50 million asset under management, but we're on a very rapid trajectory up. And then these first few deals that we've done, uh, I don't see, I don't see everything like every day because Damien and David are the ones that are out kind of doing this, but from the side, these partners that they go in with, like it's a very vulnerable situation. Like you have to be open and and we talk about this all the time where you hear it, right? And, you know, I look at guys like Don and probably may agree with this, but being open when things aren't necessarily going well, right? If there's something that happens, I had a situation with a client the other day that we had to, we had to come forward and, and say, hey, we messed up on this, but we're going to do everything we can to rectify it. And I feel like that when you, when you're, offering something to somebody, an opportunity, whatever it may be, they expect you to deliver on what you say you're going to deliver on, right? But it's when things go wrong, there's always two sides to a transaction. Like they know they're going to get, if they get this and they never see this side, they're like, okay, I'm getting what I expect. But when things go wrong and we do know at some point, we aren't perfect, we're human, things happen, right? Do we still treat them with the same a sense of urgency and respect and, uh, and honesty to bring them back. Because if you can win both sides of a transaction when it's good and bad, then I feel like you've kind of won someone for life. And so I think that I've seen that just in our experience here when things are getting rocky to where we, we do just as much to deliver on this side as much as we do on this side. Um, I want to take you back to something you said earlier, uh, how competitive you are and things like that. Um, so what, what, how, what kind of, what was your work ethic as far as learning? Um, you know, what was the process? Did you read so many books or was you just uh, being taught hand, you know, hand fed by people? How, how was your learning experience? Yeah. So we all learn different ways. Uh, for me, I'm very much audible and hands-on. So audiobooks is a way I consume podcasts and visual, right? So, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm knocking out some mundane task on the computer where it's just kind of like you're going, whether it's some emails or whatever, I'm listening to a podcast about whatever thing I want to learn about. Uh, Damien, I meet with him probably, you know, once every other week, uh, asking him questions about relevant market events that are going on or a situation that comes up, not just the one specific thing, uh, like one outcome, but I ask him maybe four or five other different outcomes, like what would this look like in these situations if they were to come up? And so uh, very hands-on, uh, audible, read, just a sponge for learning to be quite honest and it comes in all different sorts of ways so whatever can kind of suit me at the time I try to adapt myself to that I'm gonna steal something from somebody else but are anything you curious with right now 
Anything that curiosity anything like that for you right now? Is this just like an open-ended question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, anything I'm curious with. Um, so I've, and y'all have heard me talk about this, but I'm probably about 15 months into learning about cryptocurrency. And I've done a ton of research and I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated with what it offers, uh, the technology behind it, the efficiency, so on and so forth. So my question in curiosity is more centered around what, what is our technology is deflationary. We see it. It's rapid. You know, the second a new iPhone comes out, the next one is in queue to come out. So we're seeing just how quick things change. Um, and what blockchain and crypto is going to do for just the market in a five to 10 year span and how we can prepare ourselves, not asking how something wouldn't work, but how might it work, right? And so I'm stuck on this, how might this work for the future currently? And what I'm just extremely curious about mm. that I'm just, yeah. I'm blown away by it. Yeah, that's, that's cool, right? That's cool, right? Dan. final question for open up to the attendees. Um, what is the future for you? What, what is, you know, do you have any goals you try to knock out in the next five years? Is something that you projected for yourself? Yeah, I uh, want to work for myself. Uh, I think anybody does, right? Um, so my brother and I are kind of, I don't know, I got the family business is something that I'll eventually, Lord willing, end up back at. It's where my heart, my passion is. Uh, I'm really kind of learning as much as I can right now to help grow and add value to this company. Uh, but I think my heart is back out there to really help continue the legacy. And I don't know what that'll look like or a timeline, but um, that's currently like where I'm, my future is projected towards and taking everything I learned here because we've got real estate development opportunities out there. And um, so it's a win-win situation, whether I'm here or I'm back there. So, you know, you, you, you I got one more question because there's something you, I was thinking about. And one thing that you're really good at is networking. So what's the secret for you for networking? Um, I think everybody has something to give, right? Uh, we're all made uniquely. We're all made uh, with gifts and I think that, you know, honor, dignity, and respect, showing that towards each individual that you meet, because you just never know when your next, how your next opportunity is going to come. Uh, and I just, my, my goal is to never burn any bridges. I think there's, there are, there are ropes that you, that you kind of cut with some relationships. I'm not saying you treat them any different, but some aren't worth some energy, right? If it's going to take from you negatively. Uh, but just know that everybody has something to give and look for the best and come alongside and ask how can they help or like how can you help, right? So I think, uh, and just being yourself, don't try to be something you're not. <laughs> Absolutely. I definitely agree with you. All right, I'll open up for the attendees. Uh, if anybody want to ask Parker a question, so please do. I have a question. Go ahead, Lee. Can you help me to understand what was the major difference between a self-directed IRA and an e -core? Yeah. Um, well, first off, it's there's a lot of differences, meaning that they sit in two separate tax codes. Uh, you know, IRA sit in section 408, 401k sit in section 401. But as it comes to investing, what you guys do, uh, especially in the real estate world, um, IRAs are not debt friendly. So you're going to get taxed on anything that you're leveraging debt on uh, with IRAs. There's less control, more red tape. Uh, you know, recently there's a tax ruling out that essentially said that you can't be the manager of your checkbook controlled IRA. You have to give it ownership or you have to give managerial ownership to someone that's not a parent, spouse or kid 
which makes absolutely no sense to me um, why you would do that. But uh, 401ks, the way they're set up legally is a retire. It's a retirement savings trust, but they're built for corporations. So there's more flexibility and you get to, to determine who the trustee is. So with this plan, you are the trustee of this plan that you set up, which gives you more control. IRAs, the way that they're legally set up is to have a custodian or fiduciary oversight, which basically means you have to have this extra thing in the middle that tells you what you essentially can or can't do. Um, it just creates more friction in your investing process, more red tape. Uh, there's, like I said, more taxes associated, but with the 401ks, you're just, there's a lot more freedom and control than you're going to find with IRAs. Yeah, I know about U, UBI, UBI, UBIT, I think it is. Yep. What is the other one? Unrelated yeah. debt finance. Unrelated debt financed income triggered by unrelated, or that triggers unrelated business income tax. It does trigger that. But yes. you, you just said that there was recent legislation about the checkbook. Can you can you repeat that point? Because I, I don't know if I heard it correctly. Yeah, it happened back in mid-November. Uh, the case, if you want to cite it, is McNulty versus Commissioner. And essentially what happened was there was an individual who acted in a disqualified manner, uh, took sole possession of some precious metals through her IRA that she, her checkbook controlled LLC. And uh, the IRS through an audit said, hey, you can't do this. And banks are not considered uh, fiduciary custodians. They're just a holder for your assets. They are not, they aren't checking what you are and aren't doing. So she acted in a disqualified manner which they said, okay, we just don't trust you to do it anymore. So we're going to get somebody else to sign off on anything that you're doing as well as having an additional custodian sit there in the middle. So McNulty versus commissioner, just look that up and read that court case. It's not that long, but you'll get the uh, gist of what they're trying to communicate in there. And make me fall asleep. Huh? <laughs> it's make me fall asleep because my wife just set up a a, a self-directed with like a Rocket Dollar mm -hmm. and using Solera as the, because I don't know how they're using uh, Solera, but it seems as though Rocket Dollar is the custodian, Solera is the bank account. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be working because she just set that up probably three months ago. Uh, self-directed IRA? Yeah. Yeah, so if she is the manager of that checkbook controlled LLC with the bank, then it's considered disqualified. So they aren't going to tell you that, um, but it's you can go read the court case for yourself. Uh, I don't really know what else to tell you outside of that. Like, no, just because they're charging us a, a monthly fee. They're charging her a monthly fee, so they mm -hmm. do have some fiduciary responsibility to her, right? The bank? No, uh, Rocket Dollar. They so they're considered the custodian, correct? Okay. Okay. Yeah, if, if they if it's a self directed IRA, then everything's going to run through them. Yeah, but when you when it comes to the checkbook control, she's able to make any investment. It's not like when she was working with Equity Trust, where she had to ask them to process the investment and all of that, right? So that's, that's what they want you to do. So if you have a checkbook controlled LLC, then and if she is the man, so if she owns the IRA and she's also the owner of that LLC or the manager of it, correct? Yeah. That is considered disqualified as it stands right now. Okay. So what they're trying to do is take you out of the equation to act on your own behalf mm -hmm. and make the custodian be the one, like you said, with equity trust, they make them the ones who are the ones signing off on everything, making sure that you're doing it right. And, and just per, like personally, like IRAs are always going to have more friction involved and it doesn't have to be that way. And so when it comes to the type of investing that a lot of you do, especially in real estate, like it, 
you have to act quickly, right? So what's the cost of not being able to act quickly or uh, not having that control that you want over your money, right? It's yours anyway. Um, and a 401k, honestly, is going to suit a more alternative investing style because debt is your friend inside of this plan. So you don't have to worry about how you can avoid UBIT or, you know, I hear people say, well, like I bought everything all cash, which is fine, right? Like everybody's risk tolerance is different. I'm not going to, you know, poo-poo on anybody's style. But if you want to use that leverage to be able to buy more houses or more assets or more whatever, right? You can do that with a 401k structure and use that leverage to your benefit. But with an IRA, it's just going to continue to hurt you if you're going to pay additional taxes on top of that when things sell out. Got it, got it, got it. So you're saying that the going with the QRP is a lot easier from a maintenance perspective. Yeah, and the way our business model is set up is when we interact with our clients, like uh, when they call me, for instance, let's just say what a normal conversation looks like. We tell people how to do things, right? So I want to buy this specific asset. I want to get into crypto. I want to, how do I fill out PPMs? How do I do this? Like we're here to really help ensure the whole process from start to finish for all of our investors to give them the confidence that they're doing it right without any of the uh, red tape that comes along with it. So we're just a guide, right? We're like the Yoda to you being Luke Skywalker. That's how we view ourselves. We want to make sure that you're set up to win and execute, be the hero. Um, so that's, uh, that's my spiel. <laughs> How, how difficult or how easy is the process of switching from a self-directed IRA into a QRP? Well, so we're like a white glove service. Um, so we're going to take care of everything from start to finish. Uh, most of the time, people don't ever do this, but maybe once or twice in their life. And we do this every single day. So we've, we've built our, our business around inserting ourselves into every friction point to handle all of that for you. So you just have to hop in the passenger seat. We're doing, if there's any assets that you own, we're going to re-register all those for you, move everything over, make sure you're all set up, ready to go. But it takes more about five to 10 business days to get everything rocking and rolling. All right, I'll jump on your site and get some time on your calendar. Yeah, if you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, uh, I'll throw my info in the chat so y'all can have it uh, as well. Just did about five minutes ago. Thank you. He quit, he, he quit with me, ain't he? Ain't he, um, Parker? He's quit. Huh? I see he's quick with it. <laughs> he is. <laughs> Boy, Robert. Yes, yes. Uh, Parker, how are you? Thanks for uh, um, offering this um, uh, great uh, advice here. I had a question about I want to, um, if I'm looking to invest in, um, you know, as a passive investor, as an LP on yep. deals, any type of deals, I can do this through my EQRP. Correct. Okay. So it's just a checkbook. I write the check normally to the sponsor, whoever is running the uh, investment deal. And then it's in my now QR account. Yeah. Yeah. So EQRP is just a fancy marketing term that we put for enhanced qualified retirement plan. Um, but it's a checkbook controlled, uh, you know, bank account that you have access to on a mobile app. You can, you can wire, you can do write checks, you can get a debit card if you need, you know, for it. So it's very much like your normal bank account, how you would use it and operate it. Um, and because it's a bank account, you know, a, a common question is asked, well, is it just going to be sitting cash in there? It is because your control, like you tell the money where to go. We can build brokerage accounts for you. Like all this is just part of what we do. If you say, well, I want my money to gain some interest. Okay, well, we'll open up a brokerage account for you to put your money and just let it sit there. And then when you find your deal, right, you can just liquidate from the brokerage account back to your 
bank and then send that money off. And then all your distributions just come back straight to that bank account. And you can either redeploy it to another opportunity, or you could just put it back in the market until you find your next thing and then just wash, rinse, repeat. Okay. If you can explain what's the benefits of um, doing this, keeping it in the um, EQRP, you know, the main benefits. Well, I mean, it just really depends. Like I, I'm, this plan's not for everybody. It really fits a specific individual that values that freedom and control of being able to tell their retirement dollars what to do and not being limited to the things they have access to. So, you know, the benefits are, I, I use a more relevant, um, a, a more, maybe a mainstream example. Have any of y'all watched Narcos before or heard of this show? <laughs> So the thing that made him really successful is vertical integration, right? That's how he was making over $75 million a day because he controlled every aspect of the supply chain. And so with a plan like this, you are the sole owner and controller of this account, right? Um, yes, we do have annual fees like that just keep us employed, working for you guys, making sure that we're keeping your plans in compliance. but there's no, uh, you know, asset under management fees. There's, there's none of these small hidden things that you're going to see in these other companies like there are here. And so the, I say just the biggest benefit is a having a team at your back. Like if you've ever met Damien or heard of, heard of them or talked to him, I mean, the, the guy's a wealth of knowledge and our team collaborates with every, with every client that comes up. I mean, you see, I have a stand up desk because I'm never sitting down. I'm walking to other offices saying, hey, we got this situation going on. Like you ever seen something like this? And we're here to help let you know that, hey, here's an opportunity that you, if you didn't have a team, you may miss out on. Or if you didn't have a team there to help answer your question, you may get into a disqualified opportunity that you thought was right because your buddy told you you could do it when maybe you couldn't, right? So. I think it's just the power of teams. I'm somebody that, that loves that. I like know when I pay for things or, you know, go get services. I like knowing that I have people I can call a warm body and I know they're going to deliver for what I'm looking for. So uh, that's kind of for just the individual to determine. Okay. One more question for you, yeah. Parker. How about I have current um, brokerage account with, you know, I'm buying stocks here and there. What can EQRP do with that? Uh, is the brokerage with a traditional IRA or within an IRA account? No, no, just a normal brokerage account, TD Ameritrade. Yeah, so we, so it's a retirement account. So we don't deal with active dollars, right, that are taxable because these this is for retirement. So it's two separate things. You couldn't move. Now, I'm saying you couldn't move. Theoretically, the only way you can put money in a plan like this is if you've, you've got a, a sponsor for this plan, right? Whether it be yourself is the business entity or you've got a business that you actually are running that you're earning income through that you could contribute to the plan, right? So, uh, but you couldn't just arbitrarily move money from a broker's account into a retirement plan just because, if that makes sense. Like you could an IRA. Okay. Very good. Thanks a lot for your uh, yeah. answers. Anybody else? Sinto? Hey, Parker, I just signed up on, on, on for your calendar day tomorrow. Okay. But one of the things I remember I was going to do a QRP and it was talking about it's a good plan as long as I don't have any employees. And then when you do get employees, you have to give them the same benefits that you created for yourself inside of your, your QRP. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. So eventually I would want to grow this business to be to a point where I can bring on employees and yeah. access to the 401k. Yep. But then I would have to give them the same benefits that I have as the owner. Is is that correct? Well, benefits meaning the ability to uh, self-direct their retirement, just like you do. They're called safe harbor laws. Um, 
they're, they were established to essentially not discriminate against employees that you, uh, that work for you. But the beautiful thing about this plan is this is the only plan out there that gives you the ability as a business owner to self-direct your retirement and have employees. Any other plan out there, like a solo 401k is going to shut down because they don't meet the safe harbor laws. So this plan was crafted uniquely to be able to give you as the solopreneur the opportunity to self-direct and have you know, this freedom and control. And also when employees come on board, give you the same type of freedom and control as well to grow with you and still self-direct. So for me, especially if you, we all know the, the great uh, returns that real estate give you and some of these alternative investment opportunities, I mean, I'm not, I'm personally not even in the market. So, and I don't know if I'll ever get in. I just, I've learned way too much from you guys uh, over these past 18 months, how awesome real estate is, some of these cash flowing assets. And I like those returns a lot better. So if I could make all that tax free or tax deferred, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. (laughs) It does make sense, but there's a lot of people that don't think it does. (laughs) Well, you know, a lot of people are sheeps, right? And they want to be led to the slaughter. Whereas wolves, they have to go out on their own, figure out how they're going to find meat. So that's the way I look at it. Some people aren't just ready for this. They're not willing to bet on themselves and take control. But for those who are willing to bet on themselves and take control, this is like the best thing since sliced bread. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I'm glad you said that because that's something that we see. Uh, and this is more of maybe a mindset shift, right? Like we talk about people and I'm sure you all see them in your own communities and investing communities where it's like you, you show them what's about to happen, but yet because they've never challenged their way of thinking, they stay put, right? And I had a client that essentially, or I say a client, they didn't become a client, but I was like, you have a, you're about to get hit with a $40,000 tax bill. And then you're saying no, because you want to try to find something cheaper or something, you know, uh, that the opportunity costs of them continuing to do it the way they are, they're going to incur a massive tax bill for no reason. And I'm like, and they're asking that same question. Well, why should I do it? I'm like, look, I don't, I don't know how else to tell you that you're about to pay a ton of taxes, but because you're, you're caught up with this, this you're within a short-term mindset, right? Not looking out the future, not looking at the opportunity that you have. You just can't, you can't help people who don't want to be helped. Right. And, and I was one of those people for a long time, but, uh, but asking the question, how, how can, how might something be versus like working with that? Why can't I do this? I'm trying to like word it in a way, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say here. It's it's trying to shift that mindset in people's minds. And sometimes you just can't do it. I think I've read Carol Dweck's mindset book at least twice, maybe two and a half times at this point in time. And The real thing is when you have a person who has a fixed mindset, they believe that everything that has already happened to them is where they're capable of going, right? And Carol Dweck talks about the growth mindset and the growth mindset says that the world is mine and I could actually do anything for the most part. But one of the things that I learned from James Clear is that Human beings, we survived when we were cavemen and Neanderthals by being within a clan, right? So when you are trying to get someone to leave their clan, right, there is their small brain, the amygdala, that says to them, fight or flight, right? In most instances, they know that if they leave their pack, they die. So James Clear put it as simple as it could be rather than arguing with that person or debating with that person to leave their clan, give them a book. So that way, when they're arguing, (laughs) they're arguing with the book. And the next time you meet them and you say to them, well, have you read the book? That usually helps to convince them because they saw it in paper, 
and they had an opportunity to think about it. It's, it's like a mindset shift, a Jedi mind trick actually, in order to get a person to change their thinking. But James Clear has always been good at putting things into complex things into simple terms, especially when you're trying to convince people to come along for this type of journey, right? A lot of people get afraid of the $50,000 or the $25,000 that you have to put into a syndication to make it work, right? But then I ask them the question, well, um, you're gonna go into a flip. The first flip that I ever did, I had to put $70,000 out of my own pocket in order to make it happen. And that was so risky. Not only was it risky, but once I was finished with the flip, I had liability probably for the next five years, right? Because if they sued me because I didn't pull a permit for electricity or something like that, I'm on the hook. And what I tell people all the time is it's not really how much money you make, it's how much money you get to keep, right? And then that's when you have to close that circle and talk, start talking about, well, what are the taxes that I'm going to have to pay? Because literally, you know, when I finished with like three flips in a year, I wrote a six figure check to Uncle Sam. And I was like, damn, why did I do it? Why did I take on all of that risk? So all that I could do is write a check to Uncle Sam at the end of the year. Never did it again. Never did it again. But hey, some people get excited about doing fix and flips. And I say, hey, go and do it. Learn on your own. Or you can learn from me, right? It's just my opinion. Don't take my opinion. But I, I tell people, go do what you need to do. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I wish I could just go ahead and retweet everything you just said. Aaron, you got that ability to do that? <laughs> um, it was recorded, right? There you go. <laughs> okay. It is recorded. Yeah, that's, that's good, Lee. That's, uh, that's a good word. Lee will be a a future guest speaker as well. He already he's already booked already. I'm reading I'm reading as much as Laddie over here, but Laddie looks like he's falling asleep tonight. He's he busy. Might, oh, he's on maybe another meetup. Oh, okay. International. There he goes. Are you are you catching some Z's over there? No. Um. Are you, are you uh it's not it's not another meetup it's not another meetup <laughs> are, are you uh, I'm, I'm, I'm listening i'm listening i'm just i'm i'm turning i turn i'm listening to down I'm, no, are listening, you with I'm, just, I'm just right listening now? to two different things that's all are you with jerome right now no 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 that was that was over that was the last six to say that was from last week um wednesday last week wednesday till monday okay how was that is it good it was very, very. It was, it was great. I need, I needed that. I need, I need some more of that. Really. Yeah. <laughs> Good, because it was more. It wasn't like it wasn't relaxation. We did go out Saturday and Sunday, but majority of the time we was um in the presence of um like Billy Keels was there, Maurice was there, Jeremy was there, and a group of other people were there, and we we sharpened the soap, sharpened iron. You know. It was, it was all about real estate others about because different people had different businesses going on so everybody's just is a is more of getting to know each other and also like i said just said sharpening your iron yeah right it's good stuff you know, you're, you're, you're about your like your pain points bottlenecks you know hot seat <laughs> yeah <laughs> he seems like a cool dude i haven't met him in person we've 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 texted and talked a little bit, but mm -hmm. uh, he seems like a really cool guy. Yeah, very likable, very open. He's gonna be on. Um, he's gonna be here next week, right, um, Aaron? Jerome is yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Jerome He'll be on next week. Next week. Right. So there's uh, Angel. What's up, yeah. Angel? Hey, Angel. Hey. Uh. uh I don't know if that's Angel Williams or not. Oh. Yeah. Halo. 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 I'm going. Halo. 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 <laughs> mm. 
What happened there? <laughs> no, no, it's an inside thing. It's an inside thing with that. It's an inside thing what she did. <laughs> that was an inside thing. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Any more questions for Parker? Uh, thanks, Parker, for sharing your knowledge. All right. Thanks, Bob. Well, yeah. I uh yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, Aaron, you're a cool dude. I always love when I get to hang out with you, bro. And uh appreciate your what you do, man. You just show up and I I told Angel this the other week too. Y'all just y'all both are just good people. Like I hate that this is all how we can just hang out is on Zoom. But I want to hang out with y'all in person. <laughs> Well, I, I'm saying, I mean, because of Zoom, we get we get, get to see each other and and have this conversation. So, I mean, I, I love it, man. Thank you so much, my man. Great speaker, and um, thank you for sharing all your knowledge and your backstory. And um, you know, I just feel like we learned a lot about you tonight. And uh, I just want to say thank you very much, man. Don't don't go. I do have a little surprise for everybody right after this. So, all right. So let me just say this. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we will have Mr. Jerome Myers next week as a guest speaker. Um, and then um, Mr. Bulletproof, uh, what is it, Bulletproof Cashflow uh, as the next person next week. So the following week, and then after that, it's a guy named Lee Johnson. So uh, a lot of great information, a lot of great uh, guest speakers in, in the near future. So thank you very much, guys. God bless you. And I'll see you next week.